you go back into the Transformers mythology, and the six billion years ago, the Quintessa was one of the original apostles of the Transformers. I've been waiting for you, Optimus. Come meet your maker. Michael's always looking for some big theme or set piece to have in the movie. What have you done to my home? So he had those ideas about Cybertron. In this movie, you will actually set foot on Cybertron. You will get a better understanding of the history of the Transformers as it began on that planet. So Cybertron becomes a character unto itself. Michael's films are all about getting bigger and bigger, and this one is no different. We've gone planetary this time. Strike your god. It's always a challenge to find a new villain. You destroyed your world. Ooh. We always go back to the original history, and one of the areas that's always been interesting to us is the Quintessen race. I made you. You are mine to command. Quintessa is the one pulling the strings. The staff is the only way to bring life back to Cybertron. You are going to find it for me. We needed a figure that had power over everything that's going on in this movie. And she has power over Cybertron, she has power over Megatron, and Optimus Prime. So she was written as this beautiful spirit, and then we hired Gemma Chan, who plays her. I am Quintessa, the prime of life. Quintessa is a character that floats and has a mechanical frame sort of underneath her skin. That's a lot to do with ILM. From a character design standpoint, that's still grounded in sort of the rules of Transformers. Even if she's magical, and even if she's fluid, and even if she's humanoid, we're still going to make her out of metal. If it's made of metal, that means it can't be flexible like, like a single sheet of cloth, for instance. If it's lips that have to animate, it has to be segments of metal that can move, and you believe that they move, and they pivot, and they swivel. So she's fabricated out of hundreds of thousands of little metal slices that can close down into a solid form. But as soon as she moves, they all open up, and they flow as if they're underwater. Earth will die, and your world will be reborn. When we were working with the modeling department, defining her face and her facial shapes, we focused on a lot of expressions that we thought she would be doing, which is basically anger. Do you seek redemption, Prime? My maker, I do. Object confirmed as exoplanet Cybertron. The planet seems to be acting deliberately. There's two moon! There's two moons! The world is ended. Cybertron, for me, I already had a guidepost because three had gone there, so a two. In the previous movie, Cybertron, it was built mostly from hexagonal pieces. This one, because of where we would need to go with our actors, we had to have some sort of soil or dirt surface that we haven't seen in the previous film. These metal hexagons give the surface its transformer characteristic. And then on top of that, there's all these little debris and little plaque flakes, whatever you want to call it, that's holding all this stuff together. We ended up sending um, Scott Farrar and Ryan Wiedeker to Iceland to shoot a lot of the plates and plan out a lot of the uh, actual surface of Cybertron, because we were looking for a really alien environment. And we used a lot of the black sands and the really saturated green mountains of Iceland to create sort of an otherworldly effect. We melded that with footage shot in Wales. We shot the battle area with all the hexes and the close-ups of the actors in Wales, which then we surrounded with the cathedral and different things, like it looks like you're on this hero chunk, which is represented by Wales and Iceland, and then all our animated stuff that goes on beyond that. The third act was definitely our biggest challenge. There's the big set piece of the crashing Ospreys, our heroes ending up on a chunk of Cybertron 20,000 feet in the air. One thing with working with Michael is we always try and shoot something that's real 
in the scene. We try and not completely create a shot 100% computer graphics. Wherever possible, we try and have real photography to lace in with all our animated pieces. So it has that feeling of reality. We had a pretty elaborate practical effects team out there as well for explosions and a pretty substantial crew out there, as well as the background extras kind of running along the fields. When we drove onto the quarry, I had no idea what they'd actually been building there for several weeks was Cybertron. It was an incredible set. When we went to Wales, we sort of saw the bit wider scope of what was really happening. We're on Cybertron, and it is an all-out war. We're not giving up on Prime, OK? The operation is over. We stay, we're dead. The actual material on the ground wasn't quite the right color. It was a dark gray, needed to be black, so we sprayed it to sort of darken the, the floor down and the rocks. And then um, huge explosions and the army coming through. It's quite a thrill. It's a real, it's a real ride. You target three o'clock high! They were somewhat surrounded by cliffs all around. So no matter where you aimed the camera, you'd have a cliff face. We had to kind of figure out, you know, the whales plates, how does it fit with the Iceland plates and how it cuts together, and just make sure all of it makes sense. Because Iceland was shot ground level, but in the film, it's 36,000 feet in the air. So how do we make that look believable? So the decision was, if we need to see something like a mountain that looks like something you'd see from the Iceland shots, we can add that. And we have shots that, that reveal how high you are. So the puzzle pieces started to fit together in a pretty cool way. Go! 